Hello, and welcome to another special event from the British Library. My name is Jonah Albert, and I am one of the library's cultural events producers. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you to Windrush Children with Dr. Benjamin Zephaniah and historian Dr. Aisha Johnson. Our chair for today is Kieran Yates, and the event is brought to you in association with the Black Cultural Archives for Windrush Day. Before we get started, here's some housekeeping for you. Below the video, you will find social media links to enable you to continue the conversation. You'll also find more information about our speakers for today and resources about Windrush. Above the video, you will find a bookshop tab where you will have an opportunity to buy a copy of Benjamin Zephaniah's latest book, Windrush Child. You'll also find a tab for to provide us with feedback. Your feedback is important to us and it enables us to continue programming the kinds of events that you would like to see. There's also an opportunity there for you to donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. I'd like to introduce you to Kieran Yates, our chair for, this e for, uh, for the event. Kieran is a journalist, broadcaster and editor who writes about current affairs, uh, culture and politics. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Vice Magazine, The Independent and Beyond. She regularly hosts events, including South Bank's WOW Festival and the London Literature Festival. She has written a book, Generation Vexed, which, where she interviews young people from SBTV. She works frequently as a broadcaster for BBC and Channel 4 News. Please welcome Kieran Yates. It's my absolute pleasure to be joining you, the audience, um, on Windrush Day to celebrate and commemorate stories of the Windrush generation and really make the point on how richly they have contributed to Britain's past, present and future. My name is Kieran Yates. I'm a journalist and writer and sometime teacher. So please let me take this opportunity to extend very warm love to primary school teachers and students who I know are also in the audience today. So please feel empowered to ask questions in particular. Um, and you can do that by just going into the question field which will pop up underneath the video and, and we'll pick some questions later. Now I'm joined this afternoon by Dr. Aisha Johnston, who is the Learning and Engagement Manager at the Mighty Black Cultural Archives in Brixton. Um, Aisha's work does a lots of things, but mostly deals with memorializing and accurately reporting the nuances of Black British history across everything from the Mangrove Nine to this year's 40th anniversary of the Brixton uprisings through things like talks, events, panels, and preservation of a very special archive. The BCA have also uh, collaborated with Scholastic to publish a children's book, which is a collection of stories of Windrush and it's titled The Place For Me, Stories of the Windrush Generation. I'm also joined by Dr. Benjamin Zephaniah, who is an artist, a British literary hero and pioneer who's written uh, for young people and novels and radio and plays and stage and poetry. Um, and his activism has provided the foundation knowledge of anti-racism for lots of young people, including myself, and is internationally and intergenerationally renowned as a result. So thank you. Thank you for uh, all of this intergenerational learning and work that you've done. And it's a real pleasure to be here to be, to be discussing Windrush Child, which I have newly read and really enjoyed. So thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Now, I think a good place to start is to just get straight into your books um, and then to lead us to chat to other things. So, uh, Dr. Benjamin, it would be great to kind of tell us a little bit about the character of Leonard, who uh, we are reading alongside in your book, Windrush Child, who makes the journey from Marine Town in Jamaica to Manchester, the exotic plains of Manchester. Could you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Leonard as a character? Well, like all fictional character there's a lot of truth in him um I said when I wrote this book that I, I like my fiction to be true and it's and I really do mean it um I don't like to write things that are kind of unbelievable 
I've got nothing against things like talking dogs or <laughs> horses or whatever, but it's, you know, it's not my thing. I really want to keep my fiction as real as possible. So Leonard is um, a boy growing up in Jamaica and um, he thinks he's in paradise. I mean, he looks at the left, he can pluck a mango. He looks at the right, he can pluck an orange. He's got this place to play. He sits on the veranda, he talks to his mother and um, the wise man from the mountains and all this, and he just thinks he's happy. His father is in England. He came on the Empire Windrush and his father said he's going to come back to Jamaica. But then one day, Leonard is told that actually he's going to join his dad in Manchester. So he, um, he goes with his mother, he goes to the docks in Kingston in Jamaica. Um, Leonard can't understand why his mother has a passport and he doesn't. But his mother tells him, don't worry, your guarantee passage, the Queen promises us because we are British. And so, you know, he gets a bit upset, but then he realizes that, you know, Britain's promised him, so this must be true. Um, and he goes to Manchester and he can't understand why he left paradise for, and came to Manchester for a better life. And I'm nothing against Manchester, but he's in a bedsit, you know, three people in a bedsit. And he's just left this paradise island and he, he doesn't understand. Of course, he doesn't understand pension. He doesn't understand the security of a job and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's a book about him growing up. When I started this book, I knew the end more than I knew the beginning. <laughs> I knew exactly what the end was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I, we can't talk about the end because it comes as such a, a, a turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult to talk about it. But generally speaking, it's about Leonard's journey from Jamaica to England and what it was like for a young black boy growing up in England then, going to school, simply going to the park and playing as a young black boy. I mean, I was born in England, but as a young black kid, I remember, you know, walking through the park and seeing a, a gang of white kids playing football and thinking, can I ask them if I can join in? And sometimes they'd welcome me, but sometimes I would get such racist abuse. Um, and then seeing the, the racism that my mother experienced, a lot of that is in the book, um, almost word for word, some of the experiences. Um, so that's what it's about, really. It's, it's, it's kind of, a, there's a lot of talk about the Windrush generation, but you must remember, if you're talking about the Windrush generation now, lots of them were children when they came over. And I just wanted to write a story from a child's, mm -hmm. through a child's eye, through a child's mind. Yeah, one of the things I also really loved in terms of universal storytelling was how you also dealt with all the sort of messiness of domestic life. And so it felt it feels like it's a story that does justice uh, beyond just the idea of arriving, which can be a really one dimensional way of viewing a, a very rich and nuanced generation of people. Um, there are so many like stories I hear about families. I mean, I was a teenager or something when my mum had turned around and told me that I've got another sister in Jamaica, like what, you know? And I've heard so many stories of, of people like this where mm -hmm. there, there's some surprise back in the Caribbean or there's something, a big family issue that they didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, and even to do with our health, now this may seem kind of completely random, but my father um, and my uncle were very kind of, stiff upper lip um, and I remember I, I lost a couple of uncles and I said to my mother you know what's happened to them and she said oh you know it's a problem with them waterworks it's them waterworks you know and that was it I didn't know that it was prostate cancer one of the biggest killers of black men mm -hmm. you know but men didn't talk about it mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so little things like that that happened in the family that I realize now um, were really important issues, but they just didn't talk about it because they felt that um, 
they had to talk about the successful side of coming here, which is why you get these photographs of, um, mm -hmm. I, I've got one in the next room of my mum standing in front of a grand, you know, a record player saying that we have arrived. <laughs> I remember doing, um, again, it may sound like I'm going off piece here, but I remember doing a, a, t a TV programme once about why black and Asian people in Britain don't live on water. There's lots of communities in Britain that they live on boats all around the country. And we found one Rasta guy that did it, and he did it for a financial reason. But a lot of the black and Asian people came back and they said, I can't write to my family in Jamaica or Barbados or Bangladesh and tell them that I'm living on a boat. <laughs> you can't come all the way <laughs> from, from home and go to England and then write back and say, we are living on a boat, you know. <laughs> um, you know, you have to put on this idea that you're moving up the social ladder. Yeah. I show, I mean, obviously this is something that was, you know, a concern with, with your book and, and your collection of the 12 stories as well. Can you give us some insight into how important it was for you to also take these stories beyond just arriving and that's the end of it and, and give us a sort of an insight into some of the storytelling mm -hmm. story. Sure. So most of the, of the 12 stories, they give us snapshots of life back in the Caribbean before people came. In particular, you get this sense of, of, of the close-knit families, particularly very intergenerational, people being very close to their grandparents and that love they have for their grandparents. I mean, quite often families in the Caribbean, because people often, I mean, I'm talking mostly from Jamaica, which is my experience, is that they, if they migrate from the countryside to, to the towns and cities for work, they, they may leave their children with their parents. And so grandparents were you know, very important in child raising. And also because people tended to have very large families as well. So you know, one couple would not necessarily be raising 10, 12, 14 children completely on their own without their relatives. So all of the stories in the book give that sense of, of that wrench of, of, of people being you know, separated from those they're very close to. Um, I mean, Kevin George's story called The Light at the End of the Tunnel also talks about active recruitment in post-war building. And I think this is a really important story. So, that, you know, it really gives the journeys a sense of connection rather than people just randomly deciding to come to England. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that the recruiters are there already trying to encourage people to come to, to take part in the post-war rebuilding. But also there's another story by um, Selena Godden called Halen Harty, where, which takes it back before the wind rush to World War II. So the recruiters were there already encouraging people to enlist in the British Army. And then Kate Massey's story called Making Friends of British Way, her character, Lucille is actually a medical secretary with the British Army, but in Jamaica. So I think that the books really join up the history. And I know that when, when I was a child, we, when we learned about World War II, it wasn't in this way. There was no sense of, of empire or of, 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 a, of Britain's former colonies being involved in any way. So I think it's great the way the story does that. And so then the Windrush moment is no longer a moment, but it's just a stitch, you could say, a stitch in a, in a long piece of sewing. Mm -hmm. um, don't know where that, that I, I came from. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that kind of describes it really. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of that work is done because you are you're keenly involved in the archive. And, you know, I suspect actually Benjamin is also makes up part of that archive. So, you know, I'm, I, I am interested in asking you, Benjamin, if there are particularly stories from the historical archive of black history, which you particularly love and find yourself returning to. Um, gosh, there are so many stories. There's, there's one story. And in fact, I've just finished talking to him um, is a man called Alan Wilmot. Mm -hmm. um, whose um, nephew, I think it is, is the famous comedian. Yep, right. But he came on the ship before the Empire Windrush. I mean, there's, there's two things that strike me about Windrush, is that a lot of people who were not like us and interested in the history associated with the scandal. Mm -hmm. um, where actually, for, for years, we've been celebrating it, and now a lot of people associated with the scandal, but that's an, an, another thing. And the other thing is, of course, I mean, um, Aisha just alluded to it, it's not just one moment. There, there was a ship the year before, which was the one that Alan was on, actually. Mm -hmm. And he was an ex-military man. And um, What was the ship called? Almazura. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was on that ship. 
And there's a lot of ex-service people on that. But then also when we say Windrush, there's ships after Windrush, obviously. It's about a generational thing. The thing with the Windrush, it was when that when that ship arrived, there was lots of cameras there. And that's why we, we remember the name, the Empire Windrush. There's lots of other ships that arrived, but there were no cameras. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, but Alan's story is fascinating because he was an ex-military person. He came over. Um, and then he was in a band at one point, and this band was really popular. Um, and he played with Shirley Bassey and, and um, other American stars when they came over. Um, and um, he's just, it, it, you know, he's still alive and I think he's 97 or something like that. And his house is actually like a museum. When you go into his house, it's like a museum and you can see him meeting, you know, Frank and Archer and all these people. Um, and his life kind of fascinates me because um, when you speak to him, there is success, but there is also failure. At one point, he was sleeping on the streets, mm -hmm. you know. Um, at one point, me and my mother... We didn't actually sleep on the streets, but we were very close to it. And that was to do with domestic violence more than anything. But um, when I sat down and listened to his story, it really, really moved me. But there are lots of individual stories like that. It's very difficult to kind of pick one out. And the, the, the other one that fascinates me, which I'm just looking into, is the stowaway. Now, I don't know much about that story, but I'm fascinated by a, a woman who's in the dock at Jamaica, sees all these people getting on the boat and says, well, I want to go there. I've got no money, but I'm getting up, you know. And she sneaks on the ship mm -hmm. and hides. And then when they find her, they make a collection mm -hmm. to pay for her fare. I mean, those stories are quite amazing. Yeah. yeah. Aisha, I know you've done um, a lot of work in particular talking about what, uh, what, his, what history refers to as barrel children. Could you give us a, a sort of a brief explainer? Because I, I love hearing you talk about that. And and also the, the very particular soap smell, which maybe you can tell us more sure. about as well. Yeah, so the term barrel children was coined by social workers and it refers to the phenomenon of children of, of migrating parents being left behind. It's actually, there's a, a lady called Marla Jokan who's at University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. And she's doing a lot of research on this, looking at the really sort of complex emotional and psychological implications of being left behind because quite often when parents travel they didn't know how long it was going to be before they could set themselves up and send for the child so it might be that they left a baby and then once once they've settled in England they may have had more children born in England and by the time they send for that sibling that sibling could be four five six years old even older the issue with the barrels is that, is that, that they would naturally send a barrel home for the people back in, in, in the Caribbean, because of course they're in England and that means they've got everything and they must send, send back to the people, but also to the people looking after their child. Mm -hmm. And um, for some reason, soap was always one of the things that would figure quite highly in these barrels. And people would say that everything else that was in the barrel would end up smelling of soap. So even if it was food or clothing, everything had this strong smell of soap. I remember it happening the other way, whenever, because my family's quite spread out. My grandmother was in the US. And um, they, if they, they would come, if they visited, which was very rare, because it was obviously very expensive, or if they sent us anything, there would always be soap for some reason. So and it was always a particular blue bar and everything would smell of it. But um, I, th I think it is, it's, it is hard um, on, on those children. And I think, you know, some of them would have, you know, then had behavioral problems and maybe not, not settled very easily. Um, and I think it probably resonates today with the issue of um, unaccompanied minors from places of conflict coming to the UK um, and how they're, they're, you know, they're understood. But I remember my auntie, not my aunt, my great aunt was here in the 40s. So she probably came on the Manzora, Manzo, one of the, the ships that you mentioned there, Benjamin. And I know she left her son in Jamaica, but he was causing so much trouble. They eventually said, no, you've got to go to your mother. So he finally came to England as well. And he's still here now. And I think he's in his eighties, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, and I, I think there's another thing, actually, if I could just jump in. So, Benjamin, again, I love the way that stories all, all our stories interconnect. And, Benjamin, you were talking about um, Alan Wilmot. And um, back in the 80s, when my brother was a reporter at the Voice newspaper, 
that's when we discovered that my uncle in Yorkshire was in the RAF and knew Alan Wilmot. And I think my brother organized a reunion between the three of them two and another gentleman, his name I've forgotten, and wrote an article in The Voice about it. So it was just lovely to hear that, that story, Benjamin, that, that you just, just mentioned. And he, he was naughty. He left as a 17 year old and pretended to be 18 so he could enlist in the RAF. <laughs> but, um, again, they were, but I think as again, it appears they had big families. They were used to just being so separated, people going their different ways, you know. And I love how that really relates to what Benjamin's saying about, you know, your fiction being real. You know, you're writing, you're writing real stories through. I mean, sometimes you just can't make it up, some of the stories. I remember it's a, it's a different twist on, mm -hmm. on um, what we were just hearing. But um, my mother... My family come from a place called St. Elizabeth in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. It really did there. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's closest relative, the person that raised her more than anybody, was her uncle. Her mum, they lived in the same house, but my uncle spent most of the time raising my mother. In fact, he gave my mother her name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so my mother was saw part of that campaign. She saw the poster on the streets of Jamaica saying, come to England where the streets are paved with gold. Mm -hmm. She says to her sister, my auntie, you want, you want great England, try it out? And my auntie said, too damn cool, me not going there. <laughs> and my mother said, I'll give it a go. <laughs> so her uncle gave her 70 pounds and that paid for her to go to Kingston, to stay in the hotel, to get on the ship, to come to Southampton. Now, she was like a teenager, I don't, sorry, I don't know exactly what age. So my mother lived in England most of her life. I, as a teenager, started going to and from Jamaica. So I knew my mother better than her mother did. And one day I said to my mother, mother, I, you want to, I, I need to take you to, to Jamaica. So I took my mother to Jamaica and I had to introduce my mum to her mum because she didn't really know her. And it was really strange. It, it was like they, they didn't really grab each other and hug. They kind of shook hands and went, how do you do? How do you? <laughs> um, but that was a very strange moment. And, you know, they wrote every now and again. But I knew my grandmother better than my mother because I hung out with her. I went walking with her. We, I talked with her mm. um, in a way that my mother never did. Mm. So I had to introduce my mother to her, to her mother. It's a very poignant story. Mm. Really. And very close to Leonard. Um, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the sort of the, the process of, of uh, what you're writing, but can you, can you just let us into your writer's room a little bit and, and tell us sort of how you write and what your, what your soundtrack to recent work has been and you know, how, you, how you approach that? Are we, are we seeing your writer's room actually? Yeah, Benjamin, please. No, no, well, actually, no, this is my office. This is where, this is where I do my tax returns. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my writing room, I wish I could show you. If this was a laptop, I'd walk you out there and show you. But as it, when you look out the window, as far as the eye can see, there's nothing. Right. Just, and it, back in, in the back garden, there's a family of deer living. Mm -hmm. so that's my inspiration. I'm writing and these deers come along and look at me. And um, so, and it's like a little library. I'm fascinated with books. I've got a massive collection of books. Yeah fiction, all kinds of things. I'm also fascinated with, with theology. So I've got a massive collection of books on Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, stuff like that, which is really weird because I don't write about those things. But if I could study, if I had the opportunity to study, I would do theology. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated, fascinated with how religions come about. Um, but back to Windrush Child, this is, the, this is the book of done most research on. I don't, normally I kind of write the story and then I think about research issues, what, what I've got to get technically right. Mm -hmm. With this book, I mean, when Leonard arrived in Southampton from Jamaica, mm -hmm. I looked at what the weather was like on that day. I looked at the train time, the train time timetables to get him to Manchester. Mm -hmm. Where would he change? All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I literally checked the weather on all the days, if I had to mention it. Um, Everything that just so thoroughly researched. And probably for the first time ever, I used my mother as a source of research because talking to her was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's a scene I wrote in a book that I had to change where, you know, um, Leonard is watching television in Jamaica and um, seeing what it's like in England. And 
when I spoke to my mum, my mum said, no, there was no television in Jamaica. She never saw the television until she came to England. Right. And that really blew me away. There was little things like that that really helped me from my mother. Um, even uh, the way that kids played in Jamaica um, and, 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 and things like that. Um, it was very useful just sitting down and talking to my mother. She was expensive. She charges a fee, but... <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your writing soundtrack or what what has it been recently you wait maybe musically yes oh uh, no i have to i have to be in um silence really i have to listen to the birds outside it, if i'm doing something which is just kind of shifting things around then i can have um do not take me out on television yep <laughs> I can have that in the background. <laughs> Paddy McGuinness? <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no, seriously, I can have just frivolous things. Nothing serious, because then I'll engage with it. <laughs> right, so, right. I can't really have a lot of music on, but if I do want music, then it's got to be classical, because I'm not going to get in the beat. I'm not going to engage with it in the same way. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I like silence. I like the sounds of birds and the sound of my mind working. <laughs> Um, what, what about you, Asher? Is there a sort of, are there a, a soundtrack or a, or a snack of, of choice in the Black Cultural Archives when you're working? I would, I would say I agree with Benjamin. If, if I could have, in Black Cultural Archives, we don't have silence. If we could have silence, it would be great. But I know if I want to be creative, you've got to be silent. Otherwise, if you hear words, as you said, then those words start to take you in a certain direction and in, insert themselves into the book. Whereas the classical music, there's, there's nothing to latch on to in that way, so ditto. <laughs> um, can we go back to the, the Brohusal? Because I guess, you know, like, like you rightly mentioned, you know, post 2018 and the sort of British state's failings of um, a generation of people. I wonder how you metabolize that as a writer um, and as an archivist for you, Aisha. You know, I wonder how much of that period for you was about giving yourself a period of reflection or how much of that was sort of, you know, I think about Toni Morrison looking at an article and feeling like I have to write the story of this escaped slave that I've seen in the newspaper. You know, what, what was the sort of relationship between like having a time of reflection and feeling like I wanted to write directly about this issue? To Benjamin? Benjamin, yeah, Benjamin and then- Oh, sorry. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I have, uh, I knew I wanted to write about this. I just didn't know how it was going to come about. In this case, Scholastic approached me, and and I think I alluded to it before. I knew exactly what the ending was going to be. Mm. Um, and at one point, controversy. It was suggested that I may think about changing the end, the ending, and I was like, no, this is the ending. You know, I was so strong about how how it should end. Um, but um, I knew I wanted to write about it, but. Look, I mean, when the scandal happened, I remember I was doing a tour and I, most of my tour, well, naturally, of course, was in, not in multicultural places. They were in, you know, places that were rural and Devon and places like that, places where there's not a big black community. Mm. And even within some of the cities, people were talking about the Windrush scandal and I would get on stage night after night and say that this has been happening for a long time. Mm. You know, the, a particular really good journalist at The Guardian picked up the story and, and kind of gave it publicity. But if you read the Voice newspaper, almost every week they were telling you about somebody that went on holiday to Jamaica and wasn't being let back in the country or even went to France and wasn't being let back in the country. Um, and then a lot of people well, people of a certain age may remember the Exodition Squad, I think they were set up by Margaret Thatcher, whose job was to go around and get people who were deemed illegal immigrants and forcibly remove them from the country. Mm -hmm. Then we had the death of Joy Gardner, I think it was in July 1993. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be corrected, I think it was then. You know, and, and, and I, I do my, I, I would then on stage perform my poem, The Death of Joy Gardner, and people would be horrified by it. You know, she died in 13 feet of tape, mm -hmm. you know, in front of her son. Uh, so this is not new. Mm -hmm. So I have been writing about this in one way or another. 
Um, but when the when the story broke and people started talking about Windrush, I knew I wanted to come back to it again mm -hmm. in a more kind of holistic way mm -hmm. and probably a lot more personal way. Mm -hmm. um, that's our job as a writer. It's um, in the spirit of the Black Cultural Archives, you know, if, if, if we don't do it, we can't then complain when other people do it for us. We've got to do it for ourselves. We've got to kind of collect our history. We've got to tell our own stories. Um, otherwise, people will do it for us. I remember in the 70s reading a, a, a terrible report on mental health in the Black community, and it was criticising it was saying that black people had mental health problems because of the way they walk, when they walk with a lean and they walk with rhythm and when they kiss their teeth. And then on the front of the paper, it actually said, um, report written by Professor so-and-so, an expert in black people. <laughs> you know, So here's somebody who's taking the liberty of calling himself an expert in black people and claiming that he can write. And, and these reports, actually condemned a lot of people into mental health institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not like just writing a story and the, it's a fictional story that's not quite right. I mean, mm -hmm. this was a real kind of powerful stuff that really condemned people for a long time. So we have to tell our own stories and we have to archive our own history. Um, taking a liberty is such a, is such a good way to describe that. That's exactly right. Um, Aisha, I guess that, that leads me on to thinking, how much does your role, you know, your, your, you know, your real, you know, a site of much of the Caribbean diaspora and activism in Brixton. So how does, when a scandal like this breaks, how much does your role become or move out of historical archivist and move into community activist who really has to provide things beyond just telling stories? I mean, the, the great thing about Black Cultural Archives is we get to tell our, our own story. You know, we were founded by members of the Windrush generation. The material is here. I know Len Garrison did say when he, at one point in, in time that if, if nobody had gone out and collected this material, it would have been lost. Mm -hmm. And once your, your history or the evidence of your history is lost in that way, then people can say anything they want about you. So the preservation of, of the archive material is key. And I would say, um, I mean, we, we've always done, offered workshops on, on Windrush, primarily to school children, but adults as well. But since the scandal has, has broken, there's been a lot more engagement. Um, I mean, I don't want to talk about the scandal in, in a positive sense. Obviously, everything, it, it's terrible, but sometimes something comes out of something terrible. And what has come out of that is, is the fact that we now have a National Windrush Day. Mm -hmm. is, is a, a moment on which we can pin the story that we want to tell. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it can be a great celebration of, of, the, of the contributions and, and the struggles and the bravery of that pioneering generation, but it's also an opportunity for us to, to really explain what has happened and what people can do to get involved, to, to try to campaign or to try to anything to ensure that those people who have been affected can have their rights returned in some way, or at the very least, a recognition and an apology and, and something to be done that, that, to make sure this never happens again. I mean, we, we then, be, I mean, we, we, we also, this is not within my role, because my role is more, is with the learning, but we do, we did put on um, surgeries, so free advice surgeries from 2018 onwards for people affected by this first to try to help them to get their status established and secondly it was to try to get compensation mm -hmm. and again this is where the community comes together and so we had a lawyer who, who um, Jacqueline McKenzie you know, donated her time for free supported by our volunteers and I, I think it means that it's a, it's a drop in the ocean in a way I think we've helped around 400 people I don't know how many thousands have been mm -hmm. affected but um yeah. yeah, so it's like BCA is so much. It, it, it's, it's the archiving, it's the learning, and then it's the activism. And we began with activism, so we don't want to, you know, we want to stay close to our roots in that sense, moving forward. But, but you know, Benjamin, how do you, you know, how do you metabolize the rage, I guess is the question. You know, how do, how do you deal with the sort of the visceral response before you put pen to paper? Well... I have to put pen to paper, I have to do it creatively. Mm. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because people say that when I do interviews, um, 
a lot of the time I, I'm, I'm too honest and I, and, I, and I get too personal, but I have to be, you know, to understand my work, you've asked me a question. Yeah. But when I didn't express myself creatively, I kept ending up in the police station and I ended up in prison. Mm. You know? When I see some people who are angry with society and the only way they can express themselves is sometimes by putting a brick through the police station window or stuff like that because they've been stopped and searched night after night. I'm sorry, I've been there, I know what it's like. I've mm. been in the police station floor with the foot on my neck saying I can't breathe. Mm. It just happened that I happened to live. I happened to escape it. And, you know, I could have smashed a lot of windows. I could have done a lot of dangerous things, but I found, I found art and I found a way of expressing myself. I'm still angry. And there's so many things that anger me now, especially after being a child of the, lived, after living through all the things I've lived through and seeing the kind of, um, seeing everything come back, you know, the kind of racism and sexism and we're fighting the same battles again. I, I, there was a time in the 90s, but I thought it was all over and we're going to sail into a great future. Oh. And then it all came back. And now it's back and it's on the internet, it's bigger than ever. Mm. And now you've got people who are kind of, <laughs> I hate to put the two words together because I don't think they should go together, but, you know, they're, they're, they're almost racist intellectuals. That's their living, <laughs> you know. Um, so I use my art to express myself and if I can't do that again this is very personal to me but I have my art, martial arts and my meditation to go to mm -hmm. otherwise I probably could still be out there on the streets doing all those things I used to do back in the 70s. Um, both of you sort of obviously work with young people uh, and children some of whom have we have in the audience today and my question is um, uh, really about a, a passage in Windrush Child <clears throat> where Leonard's mum sort of talks about the surprise in her lifetime of, you know, first jumping aboard the Arosa Star and taking a two week journey from Jamaica to the UK. And then, you know, just sort of 20 or so years later, suddenly having an aeroplane and being able to do that in sort of, you know, a day or you know, much, much quicker. And I was wondering, you know, about how you sort of make the point that this this technology change almost makes it feel like this is like, this, you know, a Victorian period in history, this like, this old time in history where people took ships. How do you make the point for young people that this is actually very new in our history and this impacts the day-to-day -day life that many people live and you know, black people in this country live today? How do, well, you, how do you do that, Benjamin? And then if I could just jump in first, because two a couple of things come to mind. I remember I used to go back to Jamaica to the little place where my family lived. And um, one day I said to them, Do you remember I'd, it's almost like a Walkman? I had a kind of cassette player. It's a little bit bigger than a Walkman. And I put it down. I said, Can you talk and send a message to the family in England? Mm -hmm. So they, they, First of all, they didn't know what to do. And I said, just speak. And they went, hello, Valerie, how are you? And then I played it back and they literally jumped. <laughs> they'd never heard a recording. <laughs> and that was the technology of the time. Yeah. And um, I brought that back home and played it to my mother. And my mother loved it. And I've actually recently transferred it to CD. <laughs> but mm. CDs are obsolete now. I'm transferring it to, a, you know, saving it on a hard drive. <laughs> but just, that just kind of tells you how progress of things progress. Uh, not so long ago, uh, a young girl, a student of mine at university said, um, I was talking to her and I said, you know, give me a ring sometime. And she went, um, why do all you old people say, give us a ring? <laughs> I had to explain to her that once upon a time, all phones rang. <laughs> you know what I mean? For her, ring was just one of the many tones on her phone. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, we just tell them the stories about how difficult it was communicating mm. um, with family. You know, you had to write an email letter, you had to put it in the post, wait for it to arrive and then wait for somebody to do the same or the other and, and come back. Mm -hmm. it's, and we have to do this in a way of that we don't patronise them and say, well, you know, things were better when we were younger or, you know, things were just different. Basically, I mean, I, I, I really don't like people that criticize young people's music because it's too loud or whatever. I don't understand the words or that those rappers are talking too fast. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my parents said something like that when I started listening to dub and reggae, you know, and that's how you can tell somebody's getting old. You must always remember that you were once young. Mm -hmm. And so you tell people stories and you remind them. I always remind young people when I'm speaking to them that the technology 
that they have now and the music that they're listening to now will seem really old to their children and the next generation. That's just the way. Right. But what's interesting about that is that there's this an idea that technology has sort of enabled a greater connection, a global connection to the global world. Uh, and we like to think that that will impact our politics or, you know, impact our feeling of global connection. But of course, that's not always the case. Um, Aisha, for you, you know, how, how do you how do you make that point for some of the younger people who come through your doors? Well, what I do is I think it's really important when they come in for workshops that they're not just listening to me speaking or looking at pictures, but I love to include objects. So one of the things I do include is a paraffin heater. <laughs> this paraffin heater, well, it, if anyone's got grandparents in this country, you know, as soon as you go in through the door and you smell the paraffin, it just, for me, it reminds me of my great aunt. I think of fried fish and the smell of paraffin. But I asked the children first to work out what it is because they would never have seen such a thing. And when they work out that this is how people heated their houses, and that then gets them to have a stronger connection with how it would have felt to come from the Caribbean, it became a warm place, though not everywhere in the Caribbean was warm, as I always do add, up in the hills could have been very, very cold. But generally, if you came from a hot place to England, and then you have this paraffin heater that only works in the room that you're sitting in, so you go from one room to another and it's ice cold, or the toilets at the end of the garden, I think all of those things really get them to really think about how life has changed and, and the thing they love is a typewriter. I bring out a typewriter because of, we tell the story of Connie Mark who was a medical secretary in the British army and then she came to England and did all kinds of great work with remembrance of women in war. But again, looking at a typewriter and then they make those connections themselves whether with, between that and their laptops and why the design of it is the way it is. So yes, it's old fashioned, but, it, but it's kind of, they can see the development over time. Um, the same with um, those, old, those bus ticket machines. Remember when you get on the bus and then roll out the machine and now they just use an Oyster card or, or, or kids don't use anything, they don't, they don't pay at all. But seeing that development in history and things which are within living memory. And I think the good thing about that sort of thing is that it it's, encourages that intergenerational dialogue because most of our parents don't really talk about, unless you're going to ask them, they're not going to talk about things that they did in their life, which to them was just their life. They, don't, they didn't see themselves as making history. But the moment you put it before the children in the workshop and the adults who were sitting at the back on their phones, not paying attention, suddenly come to life and want to speak and tell the children about these things. And they just see that dynamism begin. And it's just so nice. I and mean, you don't have to do anything because they do it for you. <laughs> on that point before we open for questions um you know what are, what are some of the things that you both find come come up or you know what are some of the, the tired tropes or narratives about this this period of um history that you often hear and you just feel like mm. that's not true I need to debunk this um, oh, I'll jump in there if you don't mind that, that everyone came for a better life because you say that it, it then presupposes that everyone came from something worse to something better and the reality was often the opposite. People had to start absolutely at the bottom when they came here, but they, a lot of people had a better standard of living where they came from. A lot of the ex-service personnel were, were very, very skilled, but they weren't offered skilled jobs. I remember the same uncle I mentioned, who was an RAF engineer, when he was demobbed and he sought a job, they only offered him a job digging potatoes, so nothing that would utilize his skills. So I think it's important to know that, 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 that you know, people came with a variety of skills and, and knowledge. And um, also that, that there was a diversity of ethnicities as well. So the Caribbean is obviously predominantly people of African descent, but there are others as well. And I know when my mother came as a nurse and I see all the old photos, she was surrounded by a lot of Chinese women and, and people wouldn't necessarily recognize that these Chinese women were Jamaican and they were part of the Windrush generation. Although, when, and another thing is not everyone came on a ship, because if I say Windrush generation from my parents, they say, but we never came on the Windrush. So I also want to make it a point of saying people came by plane as well. You know, we did, we have technology <laughs> over there too. And just finally, the, 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 as I said earlier, that, that it's all that the Windrush is, is a moment that's part of a longer migration. Ships came before and people came afterwards by plane and so on for, because we were so, again, part of the British Empire and so integrated into that mm -hmm. empire. And I think I would like to see people look at the history more from an empire-wide or global perspective. 
yes and also that people you know they bought with them sort of uh you know, great knowledge of organizing tactics of, you know, Jamaican uh, sort of labor party tactics and, you know, union work and sort of labor understanding. So people were also bringing um, activism and knowledge that they could then use for sort of, you know, the labor workforce that they would come and sort of in industrial organizing this idea that, you know, people really, really came and shared the knowledge that they had used and tried and tested, I think is always important. Uh, but Benjamin, yeah, what, what are some of the things that you hear that are tired and you, you'd like to debunk or your you well, think think untrue narratives? It's kind of connect um, with what I should have said, that the stereotype that everybody was kind of poor, I mean, and, and uneducated almost. Alan Wilmot was a fighter pilot and an engineer. He could strip a plane down and fly it. Uh, but he found himself on the streets of, of London, um, unemployed and almost living like a tramp. Um, there was, I, I know it's again slightly off piece and it relates to the Asian community, but I think it's true also with the Caribbean community. There was a figure once, and it was in the 80s, so it's, I'm not sure how true it is now, that something like 90% of Asian shopkeepers had a PhD. Mm. Some very highly educated people came from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And they ended up, you know, giving tickets on the bus or sweeping the roads or, you know, all, that, all those kind of things. So the idea that everybody was poor uh, came here and, and uneducated mm -hmm. um, is not really true. Some people, especially when it comes to English history and almost respect, and I say this as somebody who's not a monarchist, and res but respect for the monarchy and things like that, you know, well, Jamaican history that what they were taught at school was more English than what they were getting in England. My mm -hmm. mother said when she came to England, she couldn't understand why everybody wasn't quoting Shakespeare mm -hmm. and, um, and why everybody didn't have a picture of the Queen in their house. No. But, you know, I'm just making at the moment um, a film. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm not plugging the film here, but I'm just making a film about the Windrush generation and how they've impacted football. Mm. And literally 20 minutes or so before we came on air, um, I tweeted about it because it's, it's going to come out in the summer, in September. Yeah. And the, almost immediately, somebody tweeted back because there's, there's, there's a blurb about how the Windrush generation helped the NHS um, and it um, helped the train services and, 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 and so I'm going to talk about football. And then somebody tweeted back and said, yeah, and you brought gun crime and muggins and things like this, right? Mm. Trying to say that we were all criminals. Why does somebody say that? It's because of the media, because of the way crime is reported in the black community, mm. it's because of the way you know, poverty and all these things are, re are reported in the black community. Um, mm. You know, not put into context. You know, when there's white people doing much more crime, it's much more serious drugs, that is not reported. Mm. But you know, a guy selling some splits in Brixton is reported. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's just about the way they are reported. Um, trust me, when, and this, as I said earlier, it's not just about George Floyd, it happens here. When a racist person, be that a police officer or just a civilian, has their foot on the neck of a black person or is trying to kill them or trying to shoot them or whatever, they must have no sense of the history of black people. Mm -hmm. They think that this person is uneducated not worthy of life and, and um, is either a criminal or doing something suspicious. Mm -hmm. And I've probably not really answered your question, but that's what I'm thinking about now. No, you have, thank you. That's why I think it's so important that we're writing for children because before, by the time people reach adulthood, certain misinformation has become entrenched. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we can teach these stories to children, the next generation will grow up with a much better understanding than our generation did. And that should go in some small way to promote social cohesion and, mm -hmm. and, and progress and combat some of these issues that we're facing today. Benjamin, that football project sounds amazing. I could do another hour chatting about that, but um, I'm gonna open up for some of the questions and we have one here saying, kind of relates to what you were saying actually. Is there a sense of a reversal of Windrush where the descendants of the Windrush generation are sending their children to the Caribbean for a better life? Well, I remember there was a trend for this in the um, 80s and 90s. I don't know if it's still happening. What was mm -hmm. happening was um, it was about education. Um, a lot of um, Caribbean parents thought that 
um, the schools in the Caribbean were a lot more disciplined. Right. It's not to do with the level of education. It's just to do with the discipline. You know, in Jamaica, you, you always, um, when you um, refer to your teacher, you, you do it with respect, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, you never shout back. You very rarely argue with them or anything like this. You know, you can have a debate with them. Um, but discipline is really, really tight. Um, and so um, I, I, there was a trend for that. I don't know if it's still happening. And, um, and I do remember once, again, sorry, I'm going off to another continent, but I remember once being in India and talking about truancy in Britain. And yeah. I said to the kids, in, I was in a school, and I said, is there any truancy here? And they were just like, we so appreciate school, the idea of playing truant, like mm -hmm. somebody can just take our place. Mm -hmm. So in the Caribbean, I find, and again, I found that in Asia, people value education a lot more. So there were these parents sending their children to the Caribbean for education. Mm -hmm. um, can you just, can you just, just because you've, you've teased us a little bit of football knowledge, can you just give us a little bit of sense of some of the, some of the things that you've learned on sort of on the way to making your film? And also what your, what, what's your team? Who do you support? Oh, you support? Aston Villa, of course. Oh. I got the pencil. Oh. <laughs> um, 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 well, it's about, you see, under the Empire Windrush, there were no footballers actually. Uh, right. and many of the ships afterwards and the, and the airplanes afterwards. But their descendants were interested in football, right? And so, you know, who are those people? Those are Rio, Rio Ferdinand, you know, Anton Ferdinand, um, uh, Hope Powell, the England ladies' captain. We speak to her about, you know, her history of her parents. How did they? How they came here? I found out that she literally comes from down the road from where my family come from in Jamaica, <laughs> um, and. Um, and it's just stories about what their parents thought about them when they were going into football. Andy Cole, a lot of people don't realize this, but Andy Cole's father was one of many black men, I think it was all men, that came here that went down into the coal mines. I mean, yeah. we, we know about the Windrush generation with the buses and the NHS and everything, but there was Windrush generation coal miners mm. in the pits of Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire. So, um, yeah, lots of those stories. Um, I could go on for a long time, but uh, what's the programme? Like I said, it's coming out in September and it's <laughs> BT Sports. Um, I feel like a commercial now. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're happy to buy what you're selling. Um, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to close now, but just some final thoughts. It would it'd be great just to hear just some sort of final notes of joy from both of you. Sort of what are, what are some of the things to be optimistic about, whether that is local actions that you guys have seen or, you know, some of the teaching work that you've done. Can you give us something to take away with us to make us smile. I could say the book, <laughs> a lovely colourful book. Right. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned before, I think the activism, and so we're, we're reopening our Windrush surgeries. So that's something positive. But, Great. But for my role at BCA, it's, it's got to be the, the, the engagement with, with schools and heritage organisations, which I think, um, Obviously, there was a great impetus after the death of George Floyd. Um, many organizations had a re-evaluation of their position, and we, we, we got a lot of, you know, a lot of people got in contact with us. And so we're looking at um, developing some relationships and really expanding our learning program. And I'm feeling quite optimistic from that point of view moving forward. And, and just, as I say, I, I believe in doing everything from the grassroots. So we're not, I'm not into sort of campaigning with government, I'd rather just do what I can do here at Black Cultural Archives with the local support and then take it nationally. And I can see that happening slowly but surely. Great, thank you. Benjamin, can you give us a bit of spring in our step? Right, where do I start? I remember doing a tour of libraries in London many years ago mm -hmm. and there was a young boy who was playing truant and he was following me. And in those days, I mean, Brixton, Tottenham, everywhere was burning. There was, you know, uprisings and police stop and search. And I just thought I'd rather him be with me than be on the streets. Mm. Um, Adrian Mitchell, this poet, had just written a book. And in the front of his book, he wrote not to be taught in schools. And I was doing this talk in Brixton. And I said to the audience, that I'm going to bring a book out and I'm going to be like Adrian Mitchell. I'm going to write in it not to be taught in schools. And this 14 year old kid, pulled me up and he said, Benjamin, he said, if your books were in school, I'd go to school, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. 
you know, and that really just changed my mind in a moment. The great thing is now is that we have a growing body of literature of black British writers writing about the Caribbean experience and the African experience and the Asian experience. We are kind of building a canon of work and we have teachers who are inspired and fired up and want to do something about the kind of inequalities that we see in our country. And so I think that is a major, major change. But for me, one of the most inspiring things was I was on a, uh, a Black Lives Matter march a few months ago. And I, first of all, I noticed that unlike the ones I used to go to like three or four years previously, um, there were so many white people, you know, and they were passionate and they were like angrier than me. I mean, these were, and I'll never forget this girl, she had a banner and it said, Black Lives Matter. Don't you understand, Dad? <laughs> I mean, this is a message to her racist father. Mm. So I think there is hope in the young people. Um, and I hope that young people, through reading our literature, through listening to our stories, can understand that we work best as a country when we work together. That is one of the strengths of Britain, is its multiculturalism. You know, it shouldn't be the enemy of Britain. It's not a negative. Um, it's not government sponsored multiculturalism. This is when we play football together. This is when we eat together, when we make music together, when we just play together, when we share each other's stories um, and when we fall in love together. <laughs> oh, I needed that. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. I feel like, yeah, completely uplifted and happy Windrush Day. And thank you for an opportunity to to hear from you guys in the sort of a moment of celebration and, and commemoration. Um, thank you everybody to jo that has joined us. I know that we've had I think 500 people. So thank you for taking time out. Uh, thank you both of you for doing the work. Thank you, especially to the British Library's Living Knowledge Network of Libraries who are across the country who have also made this event possible. Um, and I hope you'll feel inspired and, and energized to continue the work wherever you guys are. Thank you very, very much and goodbye. Thank you, Kieran. Bye. Thank you very much to our special guests, Benjamin Zephaniah, Aisha Johnson, and our chair, Kieran Yates. And of course, a very special thank you to, to, to you, our audience, and our partners, the Black Cultural Archives. Please remember to have a look at the bookshop to get your copy of Windrush Child. Go to our website to find out more about our cultural events program and for resources on Windrush. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. <laughs>